So as we walk through this, some of you are going to see what the Lord has been and what he is to you. He's a shield. In other words, he's the one that uh, is round about you. And when the enemy would have cut you down, who was it that shielded you on every side? So he says, the Lord, thou art my shield. And then he brings in another word, my glory. Because if there's anything at all that the devil wants to do, the devil wants to bring all of us down in shame. And if you glory in who you are, if you glory in what you have accomplished, if you glory in who you know, if you glory on the people that you can touch, all of that can come to nothing. But what keeps me from being wrapped in shame is that he is my glory. And when I would be embarrassed, when I would have to hang my head in sorrow, and you got to understand, it doesn't matter what anybody says about you and what anybody thinks about you. If you've got the Lord living on the inside, you don't have to walk with your head down because the folk around you got more money, because they think they're prettier than you are, because they think they're positioned better than you are. You have somebody that gives you a cause to. Oh, hallelujah. He's the lifter up of my head. Turn the page. Come to Psalm 10. Now, in verse 16, he tells me something else about the Lord. The Lord is what? King forever and ever. You ever see people that, that get into certain positions and they think they are it? We, we've had to do a whole lot of praying lately. Because scandal has brought down politicians throughout our city, our county, our state. And we've known of presidents that it brought down. My, my. I used to sing a song when I was a little boy growing up that I don't care how high you fly, God's got a way to bring you down. And usually when you see people brought down, in most instances, it is because they did not have the intelligence to put God on the throne. You know, it's not how great I am, it's how great thou art. And if you keep him where he's supposed to be, because it doesn't matter who doesn't believe in him, you can't bring him down because you don't believe in him. People walking around talking about they're atheists and I don't believe there is no God. What if some did not believe? Would that make the faith of the Son of God without effect? He's real whether you believe it or not. He's real whether we accept him or not. He is king not for a moment, but forever. If y'all waiting for me to do something else, I'm sorry I told y'all. As far as I'm concerned, it's Tuesday night. Turn the page. Turn to Psalm 18. When I get through with this, I'm going to sit down. Oh, I really love this one. In Psalm 18, listen to what he says in verse 2. The Lord is... 
my rock. Now, now why does he choose a rock? Because you understand that everything else in nature uh, is indicative of change. The tide of the ocean, the tide comes in. The tide goes out. The sand washes away. The trees grow old and they die. Oh, y'all don't hear me. <laughs> Glory to God. But what is there in nature that remains firm? The rock. It is the emblem of stability. That's why Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he even talked about uh, the difference in a person who builds the house on a rock and the one who builds it on the sand. The, the sand castle may look good, but it has no foundation. And when the rain descends and when the wind blows, that house, no matter how beautiful it is, it's going to fall. But when you build that house on a rock, let the wind blow, let the lightning flash, let the thunder roll, when the storm is over, it'll yet be standing because it is built on a rock. And Jesus said, now when you uh, hear my sayings and do them, you are like the man that built his house on the rock. The, the sad thing today, what is happening in our world, is that people are trying to build their life. They're trying to build their uh, vocation they're trying to build everything by not acknowledging him but when all is said and done nothing is going to stand but that which is standing on the solid rock and I was just a youngster coming along we had another song on Christ the solid rock I stand I know right now uh, some of the other religions might seem like uh, they're overtaking Christianity. Islam and Scientology and all of the other isms that are out there. But I hear the Lord saying, don't worry about it. My name is Alpha. He said, I was here before they got here. And then I got another name. My last name is Omega. <laughs> and when everything else is gone, he said, I'll yet be here. The Lord is my rock, and then he's my fortress. Hmm. When I think in terms of a fortress, I think in terms of that secure place. When I was growing up, they used to have a whole lot of you know, what they call cowboy movies on. And in uh, and those days out in the Wild West, uh, when you had the uh, society that they referred to, you know, the white man and the Indian, and really now we've learned better and we know that they are Native Americans, and that Columbus really didn't discover America. He couldn't discover something that was already populated. <laughs> but out in the wild, they are galloping and they felt, you know, can't get caught out here. But if I can make it to the fortress, if I can make it to the fort, if I can make it to the place that is secure, then uh, my life will be spared. And I want you to know that the devil, uh, he's out there. The Bible talks about the wiles of the devil, the tricks of the enemy. And you're lost in the wilderness of demonic tricks. But if you can make it to Jesus, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous do what? Run into it and they are safe. A lot of folk wonder why we call that name so much. You don't have to get to a physical place. All you got to do is run into the name. You, you can have problems. 
My God, I, I heard Mother Wall tell once uh, uh, years ago that when she used to have to walk from uh, where the church was to home and got into an area, I think, down by a railroad track one night and a uh, man was, you know, she just knew that he was getting ready to do violence to her physically, rape or whatever else. And she didn't say nothing but Jesus. <laughs> and he had to go the other way. You got a lot of folk that call his name that don't even know him. But there's a power about his name. There's something about his name that, that when demons hear it, they tremble. Psalmist said, the Lord is my rock, and then he's my fortress. He's my deliverer. That, that means that, that when I'm in it, I'm already locked up, locked up in a habit, locked up, hallelujah, in a situation that I really don't want to be in. Trying my best to escape, but I don't have the wisdom to get out of it. But the Lord is my deliverer. Tell somebody, that means he'll bring you out. Does anybody in here know him as a, a deliverer? Is anybody in here that can say he really brought me out? He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. And then he's my God. And he's my strength. I'm still in verse 2 of chapter 18. He's my strength. Anybody, you ever been weak? Just didn't see how you were going to make it? And, and then you didn't know where strength was coming from. But when you were getting ready to confess weakness, you read in the word where it said, let the weak say, I'm strong. I'm not strong in myself, but I'm strong in him. Y'all sit down. <laughs> My strength. And he's my buckler. This, this is still talking about another kind of a shield. Basically, uh, when it talks about the shield, it's usually talking about the body shield. Uh, it's about the height of maybe a little higher than a man and the width of maybe a little wider than a man. And the buckler is like a shield that they wore on their wrists that where, you know, when they got in the combat close up, they could turn it in whatever direction that they needed. Then he is the horn, oh my God, of my salvation. He is the stronghold. My salvation isn't in me, but my stronghold, the one that keeps me, even when I don't have the strength or sense to keep myself. He's the horn of my salvation. Then he's my high tower. And then I drop down to verse 46 just before I leave chapter 18. And he says, what? The Lord liveth. You don't have to worry about him dying. <laughs> the Lord that I serve, he's a living God. Don't let nobody ever fool you and make you think that he's a dead Jew somewhere on a Palestinian hillside that the disciples stole and hid. No, he's alive. He lives. And I look back again to verse 2 where it says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And that's why he says, when you couple that with verse 46, he is alive. That's why I can say, I will call upon the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. It was the time we used to sing that. I think back when Sister Myrna was with us, you know. I will call upon the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God 
my salvation be exalted. The Lord live it and blessed be the rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. Well, when I get to Psalm 20, verse 1, here the psalmist portrays the Lord as he who hears in the day of trouble. Listen to what he said. The Lord heard, or the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. Anybody in here can say the Lord is he that heard me in the day of my trouble. Turn the page. I'm halfway finished. Turn and get to Psalm 23. Oh, I think you don't even need to look at that one. But in Psalm 23, I'm here talking about the Lord is. David presents the Lord, huh, as his shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. What does he do? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Can you imagine? Here the shepherd is leading the sheep, and he doesn't carry him out somewhere where he's got dead grass and weeds, and he's got to nitpick to get a blade of green over here, and then keep on until he finds another blade of green. But he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm leading these sheep. But he said, the Lord's leading me. And he brings me right out into the middle of a green pasture where everything around me is edible. Everything around me. You know, when, when you really, when you really let your ways please the Lord, he places you where you can eat the good of the land. My God, everything around you. He blesses your family. He blesses your job. He, he, my God, he, he blesses your finance. He blesses you when you go to worship. Don't fool yourself. You all are so used to divine worship here until you take it for granted. You know, you, you take a Sunday that, that may be a little slower than the one before and I don't know what's wrong. The, the choir, they ain't, they ain't now at it today. And Bishop, he seemed to be a little off today. You'd be surprised how many churches where folk don't ever really get a pure word. They go to church feeling bad. And when they hear the sermon, they leave feeling worse. Because it's not God that's being magnified. Now, that's not to say that everybody who walked through these doors come in and go out happy. Uh, but if you come in and go out and you're not happy, it's because you're focusing on something else. <laughs> you're not focusing on the worship. Because when you focus on the worship, you can't help but go out of here with a lift. Glory to God. Jesus is lifted up and he's magnified and he's glorified. David said, he's my shepherd. He sits me down in a green pasture. And then he leads me beside still waters. They tell me sheep don't like to drink. I won't even drink from a troubled stream. But the water's got to be peaceful. That's why most things that deal even with the business side of the church, things that might ruffle the water. I deal with those kind of things in a Saturday meeting behind closed doors. Yeah. Sometimes you sit and wonder, why, did, why this and why that? We don't deal with it. Because some places when they get through trying to bring everything before the congregation, the water is so troubled until it gets muddy and you can't drink. 
That's why I don't like to deal. I don't deal with junk over the pulpit and don't want nobody else dealing with it. And then out of all of the preachers we bring in, I do my best to not bring in fighting preachers. Because you bring in preachers that like to fight. They don't do nothing but muddy up the water. God's sheep, now go and drink anything, but God's sheep got to have still water. And then he says, after he gets through doing that, he gives restoration to my tired soul. He restores my soul. Sometimes the cares of this life, the thing that you're attempting to grapple with, can beat you down so. Uh, until you come to church and, and look like uh, the music is going and everybody else is praising God, but what you've been going through you're just tired. Your spirit is tired. Your, your body is tired. Your soul is tired. And all of a sudden, you don't ever know where it's going to come from. It may be a word from the pulpit. It may be a song from the choir. Uh, it may be a word that comes from the person sitting next to you. But just something that drops in your spirit. And God uses that thing to restore you. And when you walked in the door thinking about giving up, the next thing you know, he has lifted. That, 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 that's, that's, what, that's what New Testament prophecy is all about. Go back there in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, it talks about, you know, he that before time in Israel was called a seer is now called a prophet. Uh, you know, the seer, the prophet, used to have to look and predict the future. And I don't know of anything that's messed up the body of Christ now like people trying to be Old Testament prophets and predict your future. But see, in Nehemiah 6 and 7, it says, Thou hast appointed prophets to preach of thee. Uh, so Ezekiel 37, where it says, Son of man, can these bones live? Uh, the Lord said, prophesy, which simply meant preach to the bones. Prophecy starts off meaning predicting the future but it comes on down to just being preaching. And by the time you get to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries and no man understandeth him. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. And when God gives you a prophetic gift, he just puts a word in your mouth where somebody, one of your brothers or sisters, that, that soul is tired, and God just give you the say a word that will give them edification, exhortation, or comfort. And, and, and you cannot be afraid when God puts it in your spirit to say a word of prophecy to a brother or sister. Do it. You'll lift them up. Now, when you start telling them, honey, something bad going to happen to you, you ain't speaking out of the mouth of God because he tells you to bless and curse not. He restored my soul. And then he leads me away from evil into the paths of righteousness. That's what a shepherd does. He, he leads you into the path of righteousness so you don't have to fear evil. Oh, I know we're living in a day when people call right wrong and call wrong right. But the Lord wants to lead you away from evil and lead you into the path of righteousness. And then another thing he says that the Lord is, he's my companion in the valley and even in the shadow of death, I may be going through some low places. I wish you'd tell somebody, living for the Lord is not always a mountaintop experience. Yeah, sometimes you got to go through the valley. But you got to understand, now when you go through the valley, the Lord promised that I'm with you. Some people only think God is with them when they're on the mountain when they're running and shouting and dancing and speaking in tongues. 
But, but when those times come that maybe the bills are high and the money is low, maybe pain is in your body and look like it won't leave soon enough, and look like you got more enemies than you have friends, and the devil try to tell you it's because you've done something wrong and God have left you. But I'm here to tell you, even when you are in the valley, he says, I'm with you in the valley and even in the shadow of death. That's why I say he never has left me alone. By night and by day, he's with me when? Always. He never has left me alone. Hallelujah. In the valley and in the shadow of death, he's with me. And then finally, he presents the Lord as the preparer of a table of blessing. Even when I'm surrounded by enemies. God don't care nothing about enemies. In the attitude of your enemy doesn't change God's opinion of you. Enemies that don't, look, don't like you and don't want to be in your presence. And if you're not careful, they make you feel like you are less than who you are. But the Lord says, David said, he'll prepare a table for me, even in the presence of my enemy. And the thing about it, when God set the table, he doesn't pull out a long table and then give you a half a ham sandwich. But when he prepares a table, he sets up a banquet. Hallelujah. He prepares a table where you can eat. Uh, even Jesus, uh, when, when they were out in the wilderness and, 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 and he said, y'all got anything for this crowd? They said, no, we don't have nothing and don't even have enough money. But he said, all right, make them sit down in companies of 50 and let them sit where? On the green grass, right back to the grass. He, he puts his sheep on the green grass. My, 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 my. Uh, Deacon Golden, when I think about it, I, th I think about how beautiful you got the lawn out there. He, he, he brings us on some beautiful manicured green lawn. Sit you down. And then...